Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk, Do Not Trust the ASA Trojans. Now, you might immediately be asking, what is an ASA? And these are ASA. These are Cisco Adaptive Security Appliances. At the top there, you see the original ASA, released some 15 years ago. And that was followed by the release of the ASAX, which was followed more recently by the release of the ASAX Firepower Services. Now, the ASA comes in a few other form factors as well, including a virtual appliance known as ASAV. And all of these are sort of ASA as well, despite their names, because they can run the operating system known as ASA software. Uh, that is, of course, the same operating system used by the previously mentioned ASA. Now, an ASA typically sits at the edge of your corporate network, where it can be a firewall, a VPN, an IPS, and or a router, possibly all wrapped into one. Now, the ASA is a critical asset because it acts as the gateway between the internet and your corporate network, and it also implements a variety of access controls and protections. This talk is called Do Not Trust the ASA because we're going to use a variety of features and vulnerabilities affecting the ASA in order to get root shells on the ASA itself, as well as the administrative systems that connect to it. Now, all the ASA models we discussed earlier can be managed by, a, by this thick client known as Adaptive Security Device Manager, or ASDM. ASDM is installed on an administrator's Windows system so that they can remotely connect to their ASA or ASAs and perform administrative tasks like updating firewall rules, adding VPN users, or simply monitoring the router's behavior. Uh, for about the next 20 slides or so, it's important to understand how the ASDM client and the ASA communicate. One of the first things that happens is that the ASDM client makes an HTTP request for a pdm.sgz file. Now, this file is hosted on Cisco ASA's web server, and the pdm.sgz uh, is downloaded by the client and then unpacked. The SGZ format is uh, a non-standard one, but regardless, what the client finds inside is a whole bunch of Java classes. The client will load those classes into memory, execute them, and that establishes the full administrative session with the ASA. Now, the fact that the SGZ file contains much of the client's functionality will be important uh, in a bit. Now, what's interesting about this is while that communication occurs over SSL, the ASCM client never verifies the ASA's server certificate, which means that a man in the middle, like HackerCat here, can monitor or even modify the communication between the ASDM client and the ASA itself. Essentially, this should allow HackerCat to take full control over the ASA as long as they're able to establish this man in the middle position. Now, that's not theoretical in nature. Uh, pictured here is a screenshot of me using the popular tool Man in the Middle Proxy on the ASDM client. I used the default Man in the Middle Proxy certificate, and the ASDM client gave no indication that it was under attack. Now, like I said, this should give me, the attacker, full control over the ASA, but I might be able to gain control over the administrator system as well. Recall that this pdm.sgz file is full of Java classes. If the man in the middle can introduce malicious Java classes to the SGZ, then maybe the ASDM client will execute that malicious code. To explore that, I wrote this tool called uh, Gitchu. It's an SGZ file parser. It extracts all the files from an SGZ file and drops them to disk. On the right here, you can see a recent release of, of an SGZ file contained more than 13,000 Java class files, among some other files. Most importantly, it contains a signature file. Now, this file contains valid cryptographic signatures uh, for all of the files in the SGZ. And if the ASDM client verifies the files it downloads against this signature file, then the attacker shouldn't be able to introduce malicious code. Uh, unfortunately, the client doesn't do that. Last summer, Cisco issued this advisory and assigned CVE 2021-1585. Essentially, this advisory says a man in the middle can inject arbitrary Java classes into an SGZ file and gain execution on an administrative system via ASDM. Now, Cisco didn't release a patch for, with this advisory. In fact, they didn't try to patch it until June 2022, 
and unfortunately that patch wasn't effective. And I'm told Cisco released a new patch for this vulnerability uh, this very morning, so this issue might be cleaned up as of right now, but that took more of a year, more than a year after the initial public disclosure. <clears throat> uh, the man in the middle is a difficult position to achieve for most attackers, so it's also useful to note that 1585 is actually, uh, is actually exploitable via evil endpoint. What I mean by evil endpoint is that if hacker cat can trick an administrator to connect their ASDM client to an endpoint in hacker, hacker cat's control, then hacker cat can provide the client with a malicious SGZ file, resulting in code execution on the administrator system, as pictured here. Again, that's not theoretical either. I've actually written a couple of exploits for this, uh, one of which is a Metasploit module. Uh, and this talk really emphasizes uh, the use of real exploits, particularly Metasploit modules, to really hammer home that these are viable attacks that could be pulled off by low-skilled attackers and therefore should be taken quite seriously. Now, obviously, the man in the middle aspect of this attack is much more difficult when the administrator doesn't connect to the ASA over the internet. HackerCat's going to have a hard time establishing uh, any type of access in CorpNet, so the administrator is probably safe in this configuration. But as a researcher, I wanted to find a way to attack the administrator on CorpNet as well, and I figured I'd try to modify the SGZ file on the ASA itself. Remember, the SGZ is hosted on the router's web server, so I figured I might have some type of right access there to modify it but I first needed to find how the SGZ file got on the ASA in the first place. And the answer is that it gets added to the ASA when the ASDM binary package is loaded on the system. Now, the package is available on Cisco's web website, as pictured here, but it's also loaded by default on some ASA, uh, for example, the ASAV and the test uh, ASA that we purchased, the 5506X, also came with it preloaded. But regardless, this SGZ file is uh, first introduced to the ASA's web server when this ASDM binary blob is loaded onto the ASA. And so I went hunting for the SGZ file in the ASDM binary package. Again, this is a non-standard format, so I had to do a little work, but it turned out to be simple enough. The binary package breaks down into three major parts, a general header, a manifest area, and then all the files are catted together at the end. And I was also looking for security features in this binary package, basically evidence that Cisco was signing the package. I did find this hash field in the header, so my question was, is this hash a security feature, or is it just a checksum that ensures the integrity of the file? Uh, and it turned out it's just a checksum, which might not sound like a big deal to a layperson, but it really is, because there is no Cisco signature on the binary package, anyone is able to craft their own arbitrary ASDM package, which is a big deal because it means we, as attackers, can upload arbitrary SGZ files to the ASA, among other things, which, in theory, should allow us to attack that administrator deep down in CorpNet. Uh, now, we did report this issue to Cisco back in February of this year, and Cisco released this advisory uh, in June, uh, again, without a patch. Uh, I believe a patch for this was also released today, but I haven't had a chance to look at it or verify it in any way, uh, so I don't have too much to say about that. Uh, but this advisory says exactly what we just discussed. Attackers can upload malicious ASDM packages to the ASA, which can result in code execution on hosts connecting to the router. So we're able to achieve what we set out to do. HackerCat has a malicious ASDM package hosted on the ASA, the only question that remains is, how exactly does HackerCat craft this malicious package? Now, there are actually a bunch of files in this binary package, and there are a variety of attack vectors HackerCat can pursue with these files that will result in code execution. But as we've already talked about the SGC file, and we know it's a good attack vector, uh, and we know that it's contained in this SGZ file, uh, we'll just focus on that. So let's discuss a tool that will help HackerCat build malicious ASDM binary packages. Uh, so this is a tool I wrote called The Way, and The Way has three major functions. 
Uh, it can extract, uh, it can parse and extract ASDM packages to disk, which is useful for uh, examining the contents of the package and modifying the content of a package. And it can also rebuild extracted ASDM packages. So for example, in this slide, I modify the ASDM's web portals index.html, and I modify it to say hello black hat. Then I use the way to rebuild a valid ASDM package. When the new package is loaded onto the ASA and we browse to the ASDM web portal on the router, then we'll see hello black hat now appears on the landing page. And finally, the way can just generate straight up malicious ASDM packages. And now these packages contain an SGZ file that will generate a reverse shell to an IP import of the attacker's choosing whenever an ASDM client connects to the ASA. Pictured here is a client that connected to a malicious ASDM, sending a reverse shell to my Ubuntu box. So by crafting a malicious ASDM package, we can exploit ASDM clients, not only connecting from the internet, but from CorpNet as well. The only challenge is installing our, our, our malicious ASDM package in the first place. It does require elevated privileges to install packages on the ASA, so that is certainly a limiting factor. But of course, attackers can find ways to get the required credentials, or they can use an inside attacker, or trick an administrator into installing a malicious package. Those are all very plausible attack vectors. But my favorite vector is a supply chain attack. When I bought our test ASA uh, 5506X with Firepower Services, it arrived with an ASDM package already loaded. I had no way of knowing if it was a valid Cisco ASDM package or not. The reseller could have planted a malicious package on my device and they could have had code execution within my home network when I started using and researching the ASDM interface. Now, as we've seen, this isn't a theoretical threat. It is actually a viable and demonstrable attack that, if done correctly, would leave the victim none the wiser. Uh, so that's all we we're going to focus on for ASDM hackery. The rest of this talk will focus on a particular model of ASA called the ASAX with Firepower Services. And in, th in this first section, we're going to get a root shell on the system over HTTP. As a reminder, these are the ASAX with Firepower Services. They're the latest hardware model to use the ASA name. And they are, admittedly, getting a bit long in the tooth, but still in support and use globally. Now, the name Firepower Services actually des describes a special feature of this ASA. In particular, it describes this oval, uh, this oval at the bottom labeled ASA Firepower Module Deep Packet Inspection. And what that Firepower Module actually is, is a virtual machine running Snort. Essentially, Firepower Services is an IPS that's installed directly on the ASA itself. It's a pretty nifty feature, um, and from this diagram, we can see incoming traffic is diverted um, through the virtual machine for analysis. Now, you can access the Firepower virtual machine via the Cisco CLI. Uh, the command uh, session SFR console will drop you into a Telnet session, which prompts for credentials. And once authenticated, you'll be able to access this as a apparently limited Firepower module shell except it isn't all that limited at all. By executing the expert command, you'll drop down into a bash shell on the VM, and from there you can actually sudo to root using the previously used telnet credentials. And this root shell as a feature isn't limited to terminal connections. You can use it via SSH, so anyone with SSH access to the ASA can grab a root shell on this virtual machine. Uh, now, that is actually noteworthy because this virtual machine, when configured, has network access, meaning it can communicate with the inside network uh, and it can communicate with the outside network. Uh, and that way, when you have access to this virtual machine, you can reach the network that this, the ASA is trying to protect and you can reach outwards. An attacker that grabs a root shell on this VM can install arbitrary software uh, persist through reboots and upgrades, pivot attacks inwards, exfiltrate data out, and perhaps most interestingly to me, just chill out and sniff the traffic flowing through the VM. And it's unlikely that anyone is actually monitoring this virtual machine for malicious behavior. Uh, it's, at rather, uh, it's a rather attractive uh, target for an attacker to sit in 
This type of root shell is actually something most router vendors attempt to prevent, but on this ASA, it's just a feature. Now, Cisco obviously knows this is dangerous because they have this lockdown sensor command that can disable the expert command and thus access to the root shell permanently. But I'm not entirely sure how often this command is used, and our next exploit will bypass the lockdown anyways. So I was investigating how I could land in this root shell via HTTP, and it turns out ASDM can talk to the firepower module and generate these very pretty graphs. But ASDM can't access the root shell. If I use ASDM to issue the session SFR console command, then the ASA basically replies, you can't do interactive shells over HTTP, so get out of here. So I started messing around with some command injection vectors, and here's one that was actually successful. I issued the command session SFR do backtick ID backtick, where ID is a Linux command I wanted to execute. If ID is executed, it will let us know which user the command executed as. So we can see uh, that the ASA actually responded to my request with invalid do command u would equal zero root, meaning we successfully executed the command as root within the virtual machine, which results in this scenario. Uh, an attacker over the internet can achieve a root shell on the fire, firepower module virtual machine by sending a rather simple command injection exploit. And the exploit is really simple, uh, so simple it could fit in a tweet. So pictured here, you can see a tweetable version of the exploit. You can see I used the curl utility, bash, dev TCP, and netcat to throw the exploit and catch a reverse shell originating from the ASA. And again, this is great for an attacker. They now, they now have their own malicious virtual machine on the ASA that they can use to pivot inwards and uh, exfiltrate from. Now, Cisco did release an advisory for this, but only after they realized that it was a bypass for the lockdown sensor command. Cisco has released patches for most, but not all ASAX with firepower services, uh, and their advisory kind of makes a big deal that the attack requires ASTM credentials, which is quite true, but those credentials might be easier to come by than you kind of imagine. So I'm going to list a few ways you might come along ASTM credentials. First, recall that the ASTM client is vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, additionally, by default, ASDM client authenticates to the ASA using HTTP basic authentication, which means a man in the middle can trivially extract valid ASDM credentials from any HTTP requests originate, originating from the ASDM client. Oop, oop, so there's one way. It's also worth noting that the default credentials for the ASDM interface are blank blank. And you don't have to take my word for it. This slide is taken directly from uh, Cisco's ASDM book one. And of course, we confirm this is true on our own 5506X. It also turns out the ASDM client was logging credentials to the client log file for a time. So I wrote a Metasploit module that will scan through the ASDM log files and pull out valid credentials. So that's yet another way. Uh, and finally, the ASDM web interface doesn't have brute force protection enabled by default. You have to go in and enable this account lockout feature. So the only thing that protects that interface by default is uh, an ASDM-specific user agent, one version of which is pictured here. Uh, without this user agent, the ASA ignores the inbound ASDM requests. So that's at least some type of protection. Um, Either way, I ended up writing a Metasploit module that brute, force, uh, brute forces credentials on the ASDM interface. Now, I think a lot of people believe that brute force attacks aren't very cool because they're not especially elegant, but we have seen APT like GRU use brute force attacks at scale with significant success. I'd suggest if it's good enough for GRU, it's probably good enough for me and you. So with credentials in hand, I also wrote a Metasploit module for the command injection over HTTP. Here you can see I provide IPs and credentials, throw the exploit, and catch a reverse shell yet again. So uh, we're going to switch our focus to abusing the installation of the Firepower module. Uh, 
so nothing in the remainder of this talk is actually considered a vulnerability by Cisco, but I'll let you be your own judge on that matter. So interestingly, the Firepower module is an add-on package, kind of like the ASDM package. It has to be installed. The ASAX works totally fine without it, and if the user doesn't use the IPS feature, likely they'll not want it installed in the first place. So a scenario where HackerCat has SSH access from the internet, but the Firepower module isn't installed isn't that far-fetched. But without the Firepower module installed, HackerCat can't access that special root shell. Or can he? So let's see how HackerCat can get the shell by using the Firepower boot image. Now the Firepower module installation process is a bit involved. It happens in three phases. First the installation of a boot image, then the installation of an install package, and finally an upgrade package is applied. So we're, we're gonna talk about this file labeled uh, number one here. Uh, and, and that's the boot image that's installed in phase one. The boot image needs to be downloaded from Cisco and copied to the ASA, or an image might already be present on your system, as was the case when we purchased our test device. But either way, once the image is on the ASA, you issue two commands to boot it. The first command lets the ASA know this is the boot image you want to use, and the second command actually boots it up. You then issue the session SFR console command to open a telnet connection to the boot image, and you'll be prompted for credentials. So pictured here is the default credentials for various versions of the boot image, but note the default user is always admin. Uh, so once you're authenticated, you'll drop down into the shell in the boot image, uh, and this is actually extremely limited. It's really only useful for installing stage two, the install package. It, uh, it doesn't have anything like the expert command that we saw previously. So let's take a step back. And instead log in as this undocumented user, uh, root with the password Cisco123. And bam, you got a root shell. And what's great about that is the boot image is networked too. So using hard-coded creds on the boot image gives HackerCat the special root shell again. Now, Cisco said that this is not a vulnerability because there are no security expectations during the Firepower install process. Uh, they had the same responses when we reported a command injection issue in the boot image as well. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that one because it's easier to talk about the hard-coded creds, um, but I just wanna emphasize, the boot image contains no vulnerabilities. But vulnerability or not, the hard-coded creds are dead useful. Now, I wrote a couple of exploits that automate the uploading and configuration needed to take advantage of this non-vulnerability. Here, once again, you see that we have a root shell via Metasploit. Uh, and now Cisco, uh, Cisco did remove this hard-coded credential from a more recent version of the boot image. But since the ASA doesn't actually prevent you from using older boot images, uh, I can't say that's a particularly useful mitigation. And in my mind, because you can always use these boot images, no matter their age, this is sort of a forever day. Now the problem with the previous attacks, it assumed SSH access, which is obviously uh, not going to typically be available for an attacker. So I wanted to figure out some attacks that assumes no access to the device whatsoever. Uh, I want to modify the Firepower install packages to install malicious code and then get unwitting victims to install the malicious packages. Again, let's talk about the boot image. So this is the scenario. HackerCat is totally on the outside, no access to the ESA, just sitting out there in the cold. So I want to help HackerCat out. Help, help Hacker Cat out. Uh, so I started looking at the format of the boot image. It turns out it's just a totally generic bootable Linux ISO, like it's just a live CD. You can even execute it in VMware Fusion without any type of issues. Uh, there's really nothing Cisco specific about the boot image's format. So I figured, well, why don't I just create my own live CD, my own bootable ISO, give that to an administrator, get them to install it, then the ASA should boot the malicious ISO I created, uh, because my operating theory was that the Cisco provided Firepower boot image, which is a totally normal live CD or whatever. And usually stories like this have a lot more to them, uh, what you tried, what failed, 
the funny thing is, this just simply works. Uh, I grabbed an existing script for creating tiny core Linux bootable ISOs. Uh, I added in a few features, uh, the ability to play Doom, a reverse shell, you know, the essentials. And this script, which I rebranded re re as Pinch Me, uh, generates a malicious ISO that the ASA will happily boot and assign IP addresses to. Uh, there was no trial and error because the ASA doesn't attempt to block this at all. Uh, it appears to just be a feature of the ASAX that it will boot arbitrary virtual machines. Uh, but again, this isn't a vulnerability. So remember, there are no security, expe case, security expectations for the boot image. So we can craft our own boot images, uh, distribute them as we'd like, and once installed, have our special root shell again. But the problem with the boot image is it doesn't persist through reboots. So I started looking at the install package for a more sustained attack. Now remember, the install package is part two of the Firepower module installation. The install package is installed by and overwrites the boot image. So I was trying to figure out the format the boot image expects the install package to be in. Uh, pictured here is Python taken directly from the boot image. And you can see it expects the install package to be in the form of encrypted content signed checksum package wrapper format, which is a mouthful. I'm pretty sure uh, it's actually a really secure uh, format, as far as I can tell. And again, as far as I can tell, it's the only format Cisco has ever published the install package in. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Uh, this isn't super important to know. Just note that it starts with this keyword key uh, very early on. It also turns out that the boot image has this if clause for the Firepower module that allows a second install package format. And this format is checksum package wrapper, uh, an utterly insecure format. No, six, no Cisco signatures on this one. Uh, it only has checksums like we saw with the ASDM package. Which means, in theory, we should be able to craft one of these checksum install packages and uh, give it to an administrator and get them to install it, resulting in root shell access once again. And after some really tedious reverse engineering, I did figure out that insecure format. Again, it's, it's not important. Uh, just note that the file no longer starts with a key keyword. It goes right into data. Now, the problem is that we actually need the install package to do its job, namely install a whole bunch of Cisco stuff and overwrite the boot image. Otherwise, the insta installation process will fail. So it isn't enough to know the insecure format. We need the insecure checksum package to also contain all the Cisco stuff as well. Uh, otherwise, the installation will not succeed. So I wrote a tool that does that. This tool is called What's Up. It takes a valid and signed installation package, unpackages it, inserts malicious code, repackages it into the insecure format, and then it's ready to be installed by an unwitting victim. The malicious code is just an init script. Basically, it tries to connect to an IP and port of the attacker's choosing every five minutes or so, and this init script will survive reboot, reboots uh, and even upgrades. So it's a pretty useful little attack. All you need is to get someone to install it for you. But remember, this isn't a vulnerability. But the result, again, if installed, is HackerCat is back in the root shell, this time with persistence, again, with access to the protected network, access to the internet, and access to uh, the traffic flowing through the VM. Now, I actually, describe, I actually attempted to describe this to Cisco as a uh, supply chain attack. Uh, however, they disagreed. They pointed out that the Firepower module has a root shell as a feature, uh, and a vendor could simply insert arbitrary code into the virtual machine using that root shell. So uh, no malicious installation package is really required. I agreed with their original sentiment, but to me, that's a separate and also concerning supply chain attack. But I wasn't really able to win them over to my point of view. Uh, so that's the, the hacks I have for you. Uh, in this talk, we talked about man-in-the-middle problems, credential leaks, code signing issues, package signing issues, root shell as a feature, hard-coded credentials for a root shell, command injection for root access, 
and executing arbitrary bootable ISO. Many of these make the ASA a perfect little Trojan horse. Now, having said that, let's look at some indicators and possible mitigations real quick. The number one thing I hope is taken away from this talk is that this pictured here can never be done. Never can you use ASDM over the internet without potentially risking your ASA. The man in the middle issue, to my knowledge, is not slated to be fixed. I would actually encourage you to stop using ASDM altogether and to disable the ASDM feature on your ASA. I've written a few Yara rules to help identify some of the attacks we've, we've talked about here. Uh, one rule detects malicious ASDM packages, another detects unsigned install packages, and then there are two that will look through the ASDM log files, for, one for credentials, and the other one will detect usage of malicious SGZ files. Uh, and ideally, I'd love to be able to stand up here and give you guidance on patching. However, there are a slew of issues in this talk that are not considered vulnerabilities or are unpatched or their patch status isn't clear as of today. So uh, when patching isn't an option, we usually apply mitigating controls, uh, isolate and limit access. And that's not that easy because the ASA is a critical system in your network. Now, at the very least, like I said, I disable ASDM, ensure that we're auditing who is logging into the system. Uh, we saw a number of password issues in this talk, so rotating passwords might be smart. And finally, when it comes to the ASAX with Firepower services, I actually think that root shell feature is far too dangerous, even without all the uh, additional packaging issues that we discussed. Uh, I'd personally retire and replace those as soon as possible. Uh, and be sure you have some idea what's going on in that root shell until you're able to replace them. Uh, so that's actually it. That's uh, the, all the code I've talked about is up on GitHub, uh, a lot more code actually. Uh, if you like this talk, you can find me on the normal social media sites. If you don't like the talk, don't find me there.